So I know this is the moment you've all been waiting for, some of you patiently, some of you not so patiently. But we have started our study of uh, matter, and we've looked at the properties of matter, both in <clears throat> some of our readings and, and also uh, some of our inquiry labs. So I hope you have a good idea of what matter is when we talk about it, how we describe matter, um, and what the physical and chemical properties are and how to identify a physical change versus a chemical change. So you have some familiarity with matter as it is, but now we're gonna go start digging a little bit deeper and going a little bit smaller. So you guys have been dealing mainly with, with big pieces of matter. And um, so now we're gonna go into an area of uh, matter study that may not really make sense to some of you because it's not something that you can see. Um, but here we go. All right, so uh, to start off, I kind of want to blow your mind. <laughs> and uh, don't worry if you feel completely blown away by this because people who have been doing uh, chemistry and physics for a long, long time, that's their, their entire lives, uh, still can't quite grasp the whole idea. And it requires you to uh, kind of expand your your perceptions about the universe and matter and existence, right? So the question is, is matter infinitely divisible? Is it infinitely divisible? So for example, I have this, um, I have this little dried blueberry. I really, I like dried blueberries for stacks. And it's already quite small, but if I cut it in half, then I'll have two even smaller pieces. And then if I take each of those smaller pieces and I continue to cut them in half and cut them again and cut them again and cut them again and cut them again. If, even if it's something so tiny that I can still cut it in half, then it still exists, right? It's still matter. And then if I was able to cut that in half, then that half that I have, even if it's so small, we don't have the tools to see it, visualize it in any way, then it still exists, right? Okay, so the question is, is matter infinitely divisible? Can I divide it and divide it and divide it and divide it infinitely? So, <laughs> Uh, if that doesn't kind of make your brain explode, I don't know what will. Anyway, so here's the good news. <laughs> We're not going to go any smaller than subatomic particles. So those are the smallest pieces of matter that we're going to consider in eighth grade uh, chemistry. And, um, but I do expect you to, to really grasp the idea of subatomic particles because they're so key to understanding um, most everything we do in chemistry. All right, so let's get started. So there are three different subatomic particles, and the first one that I want to talk about are protons. Okay, uh, protons have certain properties, and it doesn't matter whether this proton is part of a, a carbon atom or a hydrogen atom, or if it's part of a, a gold atom. A proton is a proton is a proton. So um, they have certain characteristics. We say that they have a positive charge. So we're talking about like magnets, electromagnetic charge, right? They have a mass uh, that's very, very, very small. Okay, you, there's, we don't have a tool that could measure uh, one proton necessarily, but uh, we have designated the proton to have a mass of one atomic mass unit and that is always abbreviated AMU. So if you see one AMU uh, and sometimes it, uh, we'll, we'll look at some other symbols that are used for that but a proton has a mass of one atomic mass unit. We can't use grams because they're so small. All right, And then uh, protons are also found in the nucleus of an atom and they also 
determine the atomic number. Now the atomic number is really important when we start using the periodic table to help us and also because protons tell us the atomic number but atomic number also tells us the number of protons in every atom of that element. So that will be key in helping you with some of our more difficult concepts. Alright, so that's protons. The next um, subatomic particle that we need to talk about are neutrons. Uh, neutrons don't have a charge. We say that they are neutral. Uh, they have the same mass as a proton, so they have the mass of one atomic mass unit. They are also found in the nucleus, but they don't have anything to do with atomic number. But if you're talking about atomic mass, you have to think about neutrons because first of all they have an atomic mass the same as a proton so if you're going to talk about protons when you're talking about the atomic mass the mass of an atom then you also have to consider the neutrons so we say that atomic mass is equal to the number of protons because each proton has a mass of one amu plus the number of neutrons because each neutron has an atomic mass of one amu so um, look at this tile here. I've, I've used a, an example from the periodic table. This is carbon. So this, this number six up here, it's typically above the chemical symbol for the element. That always tells you the atomic number. And if you know the atomic number, you know the number of protons that each atom of that element has. So carbon atoms always have six protons. So here's the deal with protons. <laughs> If you change the number of protons in an atom, it's a different element. It's the atom of a different element. So if you have an atom that has six protons in its nucleus, you absolutely positively know that you're, you're dealing with carbon. If you're looking at a model that has two protons in its nucleus, you automatically know that helium's atomic number is two, so therefore you're looking at the model of a helium atom. So protons, Atomic number, it tells you what element you're dealing with, okay? And then atomic mass is that number of protons, or the atomic number, plus the number of neutrons that you have. So if carbon has six protons and an equal number of neutrons, six, six plus six equals 12, okay? So now my first question to you is this. If carbon has six protons and six neutrons, the average carbon atom does, then why is its atomic mass down here 12.0107 and not just 12? Okay, so we'll be exploring that a little bit in class. All right, and then finally, the third subatomic particle are the electrons. Uh, and electrons are pretty crazy. If you are uh, a hyperactive kid, then you are the electron in our classroom atom, okay? They are negatively charged, so they are the exact opposite charge of the proton. There are, in, <clears throat> in every atomically neutral atom, you're gonna have equal numbers of protons and, and, uh, protons and electrons. Uh, if you don't, then you have something that's called an ion, and we'll be talking about ions and ionic bonding later in our, in our study of chemistry. Now, here's the thing about electrons. Uh, electrons, protons and neutrons are already really, really tiny. They have small, very small mass, but electrons are really tiny. So the mass of one electron is about one 1,836 of the mass of one proton. Okay, so in other words, to get the same mass, to get enough electrons to equal the mass of one proton, you've got to have 1,836 or so. Some textbooks say 1837, some say, uh, I think, 2,000. You, you'll get different numbers, but think about it. Uh, does it really, really matter? You understand how small they are because it takes so many of them to equal the mass of just one proton. And we already know protons are so tiny, right? So we can't see them under a microscope even. So um, the mass of an electron is really negligible. It's not, it's not really important for 
uh, the study of atoms. It's so small. But they are really important, and that's why you know we're going to study them and um, kind of delve into the properties of electrons. They're very important in different ways. So, but they're not found in the nucleus. The protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, and then if you notice, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> if you notice here on this image, uh, the blue there, that that's an atom model. Uh, and I can't, I'm not quite sure what kind, I don't know what I picked, but anyway, um, so this is a pretty good representation of where electrons are in relation to the nucleus. They're found in, you know, like this cloud or areas or distances away from the nucleus. So they're not in the nucleus, they're around, but they're really, um, you know, like I said before, they're very hyperactive, they're very erratic. Um, they used to think, scientists used to think that electrons really traveled in, in a set orbit, almost like uh, the Earth's orbit around the sun. But we know now through research that they're, they're really not regular at all. They're very erratic. They're all over the place. They're constantly moving. And some of them have higher energy than others. So that's going to be key to understanding bonding a little bit later on in the unit. They don't have anything to do with atomic number. They don't have anything to do with atomic mass. I mean, come on. When it takes over 1,800 of them to equal the mass of one proton, then you know that their mass is so negligible that we can't even consider it when we're talking about atomic mass. Okay? But when we start talking about bonding, electrons are the stars. They are the ones that we're going to pay the most attention to. Okay? Moving along. So now we've talked about subatomic particles, the protons, electrons, and neutrons. And protons, electrons, and neutrons um, are together in specific ways to create atoms of different elements. So an atom, the definition of an atom is the smallest particle of an element. Um, well, let's look at carbon again. Carbon has six protons. So if you see in the nucleus of this model here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six protons and you have one, two, three, four, five, six neutrons, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. So that's the model of a carbon atom. Now the one thing that you can say definitely about a carbon atom is that it has six protons. Always, always. If it doesn't have six protons in its nucleus, it's not a carbon atom. It's some other kind of element atom. All right? And then the next step up would be a molecule. So anytime you have two or more atoms that are bonded together chemically, and we will, like I said earlier, we'll talk about bonding a little bit later in our unit. Um, it doesn't matter if it's two oxygen uh, atoms like here on the left or like a water molecule that has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, okay? But this oxygen is bonded to this oxygen, and this oxygen is bonded to this hydrogen, and it's also bonded with this other hydrogen. So anytime you have two or more atoms that are bonded together chemically, we call that a molecule. All right? And then there's also this word compound. Now, a compound is a, a substance that's composed of two or more separate elements. So you will have... Uh, two or three or four or, you know, uh, 56 uh, different atoms, but they have to be of separate elements. So the water molecule is a molecule and it's also a compound. This oxygen molecule here, which is two oxygen uh, atoms bonded together, this is a molecule, but it's not a compound because they're the same kind of atom. They're both oxygen atoms. The water molecule, you've got oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms that are bonded together, so you can call it a compound. It's also a molecule. So that's what this is. A molecule is formed when two or more atoms join together chemically. A compound is a molecule that contains at least two different elements. So, all compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. All right, so you might want to pause the video here, read through that, think about it, what does it mean, and we'll be looking at it in class a little bit too, okay? All right, 
So now, one of my favorite tools that we use in science ever is the periodic table. It's a very unassuming tool. Most people go, it's just a piece of paper, right? No, it's so much more. You're going to love the periodic table, and you're going to be amazed at what you know about matter and about chemistry just when you understand the periodic table. It's a great tool. So let's take a look at it. So the periodic table, uh, we're, we'll have some in class for you to use um, <clears throat> when you're working on, on uh, creating models and things like that. But um, I wanted to uh, just take one tile off of the periodic table to give you an idea of what you can understand and know about different elements just based on their tile on the periodic table. So I selected molybdenum for this one. Isn't that a great name? Molybdenum. Say it three times real fast, okay? So the element name is sometimes on the tile, um, sometimes it's at the top, some, sometimes it's at the bottom. Some, uh, they might, you know, if, if it's a hotshot chemistry major periodic table, maybe it doesn't have the name because they know what all the symbols are anyway. So, but we're going to have the name on ours, right? And then you also will have the atomic number. Now, if you notice, molybdenum's um, atomic number is 42. So that tells you that every atom of molybdenum has 42 protons in its nucleus. Every single one of them, every single molybdenum atom has 42 protons. If it doesn't have 42 protons, it ain't molybdenum. Okay? And then you also, on the tile and periodic table, you get this great symbol. The atomic symbol for molybdenum is MO, but the case is very important. So if you look at the first letter, it's a capital M. The second letter is a lowercase O. This is very important in chemistry that you always honor the case that's on the chemical symbol of the periodic table. And uh, I think back earlier in the year when we were looking at carbon monoxide, uh, on our little quiz. Remember I said if you have a capital O and a capital, um, sorry, capital C and a capital O, that's carbon monoxide. But if you have the capital O with a lowercase capital, sorry, capital C with a lowercase O, then you're talking about cobalt. Two completely different things. Cobalt is an element. Carbon monoxide is a molecule. And they're very different. Their properties are very different. They act very differently. So that uh, atomic symbol that's there, uh, the case is absolutely positively uh, important. Don't forget. Okay. And then at the bottom of the tile for the elements, you will have the atomic mass. Now, here's a little hint to the question that I asked you earlier about carbon. Uh, this is typically an average mass, but it's an average mass of what? I can't imagine. Maybe we'll find out in class. Okay, so um, isotopes is another concept that's really quite simple once you get used to it. But um, remember how I said that the atomic number tells you how many protons and the number of protons in an atom tell you which element you're dealing with. So if we look at both of these examples here, this one has, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four protons. The protons are in red. And this one has, uh, over here, one, two, three, four protons, also in red or orange, okay? So, guys, this is the same element. Both of these are beryllium, okay? Beryllium atoms have four protons, okay? Now, the one thing that's different, though, is this one has one, two, three, four neutrons, okay? This one has one, two, three, four, five, okay? So remember I said that neutrons don't have anything to do with atomic number, but they have everything to do with atomic mass. So, and then also beryllium always has four protons. And both of these atom models are beryllium because they have four protons. But if they have differing number of neutrons, we call them isotopes. So both of them are beryllium atoms, and both of them are isotopes of beryllium. And then the name of the isotope is determined by the isotope's atomic mass. So the one on the left, 
Atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, right? So this has four neutrons and four protons, so its atomic mass is eight. This one on the right has four protons because it's beryllium, and if it has four protons, it must be beryllium, and it has one, two, three, four, five neutrons, so five plus four is nine. What? All right, so what we're dealing with is beryllium eight and beryllium nine. Both of these are isotopes of the element beryllium. Both of them are beryllium atoms because they have four protons. Of course, they have four because they're both beryllium. But the difference is the number of neutrons. The one on the left, beryllium-8, has four neutrons, so it has an atomic mass of eight AMU, atomic mass units, and beryllium-9 has five neutrons, which makes its atomic mass nine AMU. They're the exact same element, but they are isotopes of that element, and isotopes depend on the atomic mass of the atom. They are also named by the atomic mass. So this one, this isotope here, is called beryllium-8, and the one on the right is called beryllium-9. Okay, so I hope you're ready to uh, jump off into some chemistry. We're going to be using the periodic table, drawing a lot of models of atoms, uh, practicing isotopes, and getting comfortable with the different subatomic particles. So I hope you're ready. I think you're amazing. I think it's going to be a great unit. I'll see you in class.